it gives skill. Now you'll choose uh, tools properly. Choose a closure. Choose a closure. <laughs> Do you have container problems? No. Now you're done, you see? <laughs> there are a lot of skill hiding there. So thank you for staying with us. Um, uh, today I'm going to tell about things that go beyond software cra craftsmanship. But since it's a kind of sort of software craftsmanship event, do you know what software craftsmanship is? What, what is software craftsmanship then? Religion. Religion? <laughs> Something fluffy. You can't measure it. You can't touch it. What's that? Agile 2.0. So the thing is that, uh, I will describe it quickly, it's about being professional in software development. How to be professional, that's all about software craftsmanship. Now, as you understand what software craftsmanship is, we can go beyond craftsmanship immediately, right? So why beyond software craftsmanship? I believe that in order to succeed in professional life, you should know much more than technical stuff. You can't really conquer the world by applying solely your Java or .NET muscle. It doesn't really work well. So today I'm going to tell you about things that I have learned the hard way. Something that no one taught me in school, unfortunately. And I really love it to, I would be happy if someone told them about this earlier. So this is a story about Johnny and his road towards a remarkable career. So meet Johnny. Johnny is kind of regular guy like most of us, right? He's a Java developer. He works at a company called Schmitico. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he has five years of software development experience coming from companies like uh, uh, Gizma, Baxenture, and Revolution Gaming. <laughs> Revolution Gaming. So he works full time. He has decent salary. And he prays software craftsmanship gods. Uh, John has a boss, like, like most of us, Milton. Milton is PM at Schmitico, works together with uh, John in the same project. He's a serious guy, senior guy. He reports directly to top management. And he doesn't give a shit about craftsmanship. Say, craftsmanship, you say craftsmanship? It doesn't really work because it costs a lot and it does not contribute to value at all. So I don't care. And Johnny actually hates Milton because every year Johnny goes to Milton after all his achievements and begs for a 10% salary rise. Every year he said, you know, uh, you know, Milton, uh, I was the best guy in the team. I know a lot of fancy frameworks. I, I, I use TDD, but most of my team members don't use TDD. But I use TDD. They don't use TDD. I'm the best guy. I need a 10% salary rise. And Milton goes, you know, Johnny, yeah, you're, you're awesome. Keep rocking. We need you. But there's only one problem. We do not have budget this year. Have an iPhone. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Does it sound familiar? <laughs> sure, that's how it happens every year. So feeling sad and undervalued, Johnny goes to his mentor, Lawrence. So Lawrence is a ser serious guy. He's a retired Golang software architect <laughs> with 10 years of experience at Golang. <laughs> Already. <laughs> it's an, we're, we're talking about future. He's very experienced, and uh, Johnny goes to Lawrence and says, you know, you know, Lawrence, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave today, because right now I work in the company who does not value me at all. Right now, there are so many companies uh, on the market, they can pay me much more, but these guys, they don't care about my technical skills. I'm the smartest guy in the company. What the heck? They don't care about me. And Lawrence went, but what did you tell your boss to get the salary rise? Uh, I said, I know TDD, BDD, DDD, how to refactor govna code on a daily basis. 
I know a plenty of great frameworks like Spock, Spark, as well as machine learning and microkernels. <laughs> what? <laughs> man, man, he went. But who cares? But who cares? What, wh wh who cares? Who cares? Who cares about things that you know? Do you really use it to bring value to your customers? Do you, do you really use it? Because from management perspective, it doesn't really matter what you have in this head, how many skills you possess. If you can't really help, if, if it doesn't help your management or a company to monetize or to bring more money, it's a waste. It's just a waste, okay? So why don't you use all this stuff that you have just mentioned? Because Milton doesn't let me. So what Milton suggests you to use instead? Oh, Milton says that uh, as uh, most of the developers in the company, you have to uh, I have to stick to HHDD. HHDD? What the fuck is HHDD? Oh, it's very popular in our <laughs> company. Oh. Everyone is doing HHDD. It's so important. And Milton thinks that it's the right way to go. HHDD, go ahead. You know, Johnny, there's one good thing about all these engineering practices like refactoring or TDD. You don't have to convince anyone. They are totally personal and you decide whether you have to use this practices to deliver value or not. You don't have to scream, oh, let's use TDD. You don't have to do this. Just do it because if you think that is something that can guarantee high quality software, like a better returns of investment, better deliverables, delighted customer, just go ahead. You don't have to convince anyone. If it's something that delights your customer, just go ahead. You need, uh, imagine this, you, uh, you should have a surgery. And you go to surgeon and tell surgeon, you have to use this tool to, to, to make a surgery. This is insane, right? So you go to a surgeon and pray that, that uh, this surgeon knows what tools are better for this job, right? Tools and practices. Even if you're, if you're manager of surgeons, if you're a manager, if you even work in the healthcare industry, you can't really tell surgeon what tools to use. You know why? You know why? Because you are not surgeon. Because you are not surgeon. It's crystal, it's crystal clear. You are not surgeon, so we can't tell someone who is surgeon how to make a surgery. Right? So this is clear. I like this one. I found this online. To avoid injury, don't tell me how to do my job. <laughs> because that's my craft, that's my job. I know what to do, crystal clear. So do whatever you know is right to delight customer because you don't need anyone's permission to be professional. You don't have to, an to ask anyone, this is very important. Because people who are paying you money to be a software developer, they actually uh, kind of, they, uh, they uh, depending on your skills and they think that you know how to do things right. I once, so uh, I recently had a project in the UK. I don't, ha I don't work with Zala. <laughs> so I had a project in the UK and it was a pretty shitty project. And my job was to coach people on, a, on the engineering practice like TDD pair programming and all this stuff. And uh, it was a very, there was a tough sh uh, shadow, so it was a problematic uh, project. And uh, on the week one, I sit together with the developers as, uh, and started doing pair programming with them. I was sitting uh, in the room, <laughs> the, the room was called War Room, actually. We sit in a separate room, it, uh, it was a war room. And uh, there was an engineering manager, and I was a contractor. So, an engineer, since I was hired as a contractor to help solving the problems, uh, engineering manager was extremely unhappy because he took it personal, right? Someone comes to coach developers, probably something is not going pretty well in the company. So this engineering manager came into the room one morning and, and said publicly, 
you know already you're wasting our time. Things that you tell right now to developers, you're, they're not right, you're just wasting our time. You have to stop doing it immediately. I was kind of, okay. And I woke up and said, you know, show me how to do it better. Just sit down and show me how can you do it better than I can. And he said, are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you, just sit down and show me. I was very sad, I was into I was burning inside. Just sit down and show me. I'm not going to show you. So what the heck, you're teaching me how to do things. Sit down and show me. He left for a coffee, Let, let's have a personal discussion. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, we sit together in a meeting room, I say, okay, you say just publicly that, that I'm an unprofessional guy, let's do it this way, let's have a challenge. So together with developers, we will sit in front of developers together in the room, and we will pick some technical task from Jira. You will write code and I will write code. You can do it whatever you want, write, uh, write this code using HHDD, I will do how I think is right. Deal? Deal. Uh, he was like an ex-engineer, so he, 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 he's not bad at coding, actually. He's an engineer manager with coding experience. Team was happy, oh my god, it's a war. It's a war, <laughs> blood. And uh, so after a few days, we sit together in the room. Uh, we let developers to choose a technical task from Jira. And so we sat down. In about an hour, I finished my task and say, how, how are you? And he, so it was crystal clear at that point that in, the f in, in this hour, he didn't manage to finish like a one-fifth of the work that I have produced. It, it doesn't mean that he is bad. But, but the point is that he was not, he was not able to convince me. He, he just, he, he lost. He was like, a, he had a lot of like a red code, nothing compiled, and he just applied the shotgun refactoring and all this stuff. So I said, ha, huh, you see? Say, no, never teach me how to do stuff if you can't prove me. And this is very important because if someone goes to you and tells you, you you are doing things wrong or you have to do it differently, you always have to remember one thing. Sit down and show me. Use it. Sit down and show me right now how to do it differently. Okay? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense. Show me. So be ready to challenge someone. However, be ready to be challenged back. Be ready to be challenged back. It's very important. And what about uh, these things that require some permission from your boss or cost some money? Let's say you think that you have to deliver, you can't deliver cool functionality or delight customer, but uh, it goes against your boss or manager's beliefs. What should you do? And for me personally, it's, kind, it, it's quite obvious because your job is not to delight your boss. Your job is to delight your customer, even if, if your boss is paying you money. It's kind of risky. However, here's the trick. Just look. Here's how money works in the Johnny's company. Customers generate revenue. Hey, they pay you money. They generate revenue. So the top management decides how to use this revenue effectively. So together with Milton, they create a budget, limited budget, some money, and then Milton pays Johnny's salary. So the question is, who is stronger than Milton? Money. <laughs> exactly. But who in particular is stronger than Milton? Sorry? Customer. customer. Exactly. Why not top management? Because customer always stronger than top management because they own and pay money, right? So it's kind of customer is the ultimate power, ultimate decision maker, boss of all bosses, right? So whatever customer says is like a right is right, even if it's not, but it's right. So here's the thing. So uh, instead of like pumping money from Milton, hey, give me 10% of salary. Instead of pumping money from the inside, you can think how to add value from the outside and bring more money to your company. You go, oh, it's kind, of, it's kind of weird, but it's so simple, actually, because Milton has a limited budget, so you, can't, you have to add from the outside. And I would say one thing to you, if you don't really understand how your company makes money, it costs you a lot. Every day, it costs you a lot. For, 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 for a lot of developers, 
uh, I'm not, I, uh, I work with, they see money as a fog, they just come from the cloud, put money, or they do not see something beyond his, uh, their managers. And that's insane, it costs you money every day. You have to know where to add value. And in order to understand where to add value, you have to understand how your company earns money. Crystal clear. So let customer judge. Customers ultimate power. Let customer judge what's important, what's not. What they want to pay for, what they don't want to pay for, when and why, right? How can we do it? If it goes against your boss beliefs, wow. How can you do it? Just make your reasoning public. Make your reasoning public. How? Let's say you can tell you, you can write an email to your customer. Hey guys, uh, what do you think if we chump? Is it something bad? Did you do something bad? Or that goes against like a boss will? Nothing bad. Or if you do it this way, hey, you know our rivals are doing this, this, and that. What if we did you do something bad? Absolutely no. Or I like this one more. Hey, check out what I have built. <laughs> do you like it? Do you do it? Oh my, this guy, they don't, let, they don't give, uh, give me a time. They don't give me a budget. Just go and build it and show something that works. If customers like it, you have a project. Go ahead and extend it. So that's how it should be, okay? like it or not, it, no, but it's not that easy. Because if you go to your customer and say, we need to start doing TDD, say what? They don't get it because you have to adjust your language. You have to speak customer's language. I, I, I work at a, as a consultant. So actually, I never go to my customer and tell them, you know, I will, uh, I want, um, I will teach you how to do high quality software. They never buy high quality software. They don't need that. They don't understand what high quality software is. What I tell, hey guys, it's a mission critical project. It's a very important project for you. Oh, you don't want to fail, right? So <laughs> that's you don't want to fail, right? So the thing is that uh, you, you, you have to do it right. And in order to do it right, so you have to do it right because actually since in, it's, it's a long term project, you want to increase software lifespan. You want to make it long living. And it will decrease, it will increase returns of investment. It's clear for a customer. They want to increase the ROI. You never sell high quality software. It's just a how to increase this ROI by increasing software lifespan, right? So just you have to adjust your language and speak value language, not just a skill. You will never sell skills and all the stuff, you know, Sparks, Governor Code and everything. It doesn't really work. What can you bring on to the table? And that's the question in a customer language. Okay, why do you think Scrum sells so well? Why Scrum sells so well? Fast delivery, fine, good. It, sorry? Focus on value, fine. There's one tiny thing that, that distinguishes Scrum from many other idea that are in, in the IT world, like a, no estimates. Why no one is, using no estimates, basically, still. It's so popular, a lot of hype. I think that the, the major difference is it's clear with Scrum where to start and how to start. Even if most companies doing it wrong, it's clear how to start. You, you should have a product owner, Scrum master, all the stuff, cross-functional teams, here's a backlog, here's a retrospective. It's clear what to use. There are particular guidelines, whether with no estimates, just stop estimating and you'll get fired immediately. So it's clear how to start. Basically, if you want to sell something to your customer, make it clear how to start. Even if, you're plan if you, you plan to do revolution in your company, change the world. Anyway, keep your revolution in mind. Write it somewhere, but sell small piece of this revolution. Just a small hook, okay? Because there will always be a, res a resistance. Why there is a resistance? Because people are afraid of big changes and revolution. How to reduce resistance? Sell smaller changes and concrete changes, okay? And tell them, I, I'm ready to lead. I'm going to lead this project. Make customer feel that you're confident, actually. Uh, we, 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 I might help you. I, I'm 80% sure. 
fuck off, just go and go and <laughs> go and code. No. I will lead this project till the end. That's what you should tell, always. And don't be a jerk. You know why? If you go to your customer and tell, oh, boss doesn't let me to do this. Or, you know, I'm the best guy. My team don't write tests, but I do. It's a suicide for the whole project. No one will, will gain from it. And I s constantly f see people doing it. They want to get this prize from, for, uh, f from the customer by telling how cool they are and how others suck. It's a suicide for a project. I saw several projects get canceled because of this. One of them was in Latvia, actually. So remember one thing always. If you point finger at someone, how many fingers point back at you? Three. Always. Try doing differently. So if you do finger pointing, always three fingers are staying back at you. So if you want to achieve something blaming someone, it's the worst possible practice. It never works. It might work in the short term, but you'll fail. That's how it is. So Johnny followed the advice. Uh, and he started selling directly to the customer. He went to the central marketplace. He started selling directly to the customer because customer is always right. He also started doing TDD. You know why? Because it makes him faster. It makes him more confident. And it makes, it, it makes a huge difference. It's not for someone, even if your team is not doing TDD. Who fucking cares? Just do it and that's it. Feel the difference. Uh, it's actually a natural course of selling practices to the team or someone. Uh, because you want to achieve, basically you sell practices usually like, hey, PDD is the best practices, Uncle, you know, Kent Beck described it in an in extreme programming book. Whoa, that's the way to go. I said, what the? <laughs> so it does really work. Because you want to, you want to, to see it differently. When your team, sees you succeeding. Wow, why do you deliver value that fast? They come and ask, how do you do it? And then tell, it's TDD. <laughs> so it should, be the, it should be the opposite, right? So it, you should change direction. So project had a problem. Customer was unhappy, kind of the software quality were quite low. And top management went to talk to a QA manager. And QA manager, under pressure, told that developers are doing a crappy work. Uh, when developers say done, it's not actually done. Because QA guys, they find a lot of bugs. And when these bugs are fixed, more bugs bubble up. So, but they also say that not everyone is like that. You know, John is kind of different guy. When he says done, it's actually done and no new, new bugs bubble up. It always works. And when the customer asks to make a quick adjustment, he goes and makes quick adjustment without breaking things. I'm not sure how John is doing it. He says TDD, but I don't understand. And you know, a customer now asks Johnny to develop the most vision critical functionality because he's actually getting things done fast. In the same time, Another meeting and uh, discussion occurs. Top management, call, uh, customer calls top management and tells, you know, Johnny's very active guy. He generates so many ideas that we haven't ever heard from Milton. So many ideas. And you know what? This continuous delivery idea sucks and we will never have it in our project. But you know what? We have one more project waiting in a queue, one billion unicorn project. And we think that Johnny can add value here. Next day, top management has a meeting with Milton. You know, Milton, we want to talk to you. Is Johnny happy? <laughs> is Johnny happy? Please make sure that Johnny is happy. Protect our boy. <laughs> Something like this. So by doing something that Johnny think is actually right, and by delighting customer, Johnny get protection, like armor. He has like a protection from everything that happens in the company. He became like an exception to the rule. And you know why? Because company want to protect someone who either brings money 
or who will bring money potentially, or who has a good relationship with customers. It's clear, they're not stupid. So I call it CBI, corporate bullshit immunity. So the more you bring to the company, the more CBI you have, right? And think about it now. The more you take from the inside, think salary. The less CBI you have. Think about it. Do you add enough value? And uh, think about salary with uh, with uh, with uh, taxes as well. Okay. So, Johnny, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I give you 50% salary rise. Milton, but what about this limited budget? Oh, don't think about it. Let's leave budget to the rest of the team. Not this time, Milton. Go ahead and buy everyone new Macbox. <laughs> so together with the team, Johnny celebrated his salary rise and new Macbox by smashing old workstation with the baseball bats. Johnny is successful, right? End of the story. What do you think? Ah, not that easy. Not yet. Johnny goes to his girlfriend, Katie. Katie is a QA engineer working at company of Taraklasniki. <laughs> you know, Katie, tomorrow I'll go to Milton and ask him to make me senior full stack Java developer. Hey, all chances to get this senior title, right? He's the best guy in the team. Johnny goes to Milton. And you know what Milton says? Um, you know, Johnny, you're good, you're good. You're doing a great job, really, you're doing a great job. There is one tiny thing, one little thing that you miss. You received a lot of negative feedback from your peers during annual performance review. Johnny, and you know what? Actually, you have the worst results among the team members. What the fuck? I'm the best guy in the team. I'm the most advanced guy in the team. Well, fix the problem and come back later, but uh, take a corporate insurance this time. Okay? Johnny, don't understand what happens. He drives back to his girlfriend. He's the best performer, but Worst, uh, best performer with the worst performance. How, how it is possible? Oh, it is. He goes to girlfriend. A girl, girlfriend says, I knew that you will never be a full stack senior Java developer and says, take your belongings and go away. <laughs> he goes to his mentor, Lawrence. Again, crying. Lawrence, life sucks. Life sucks, I'm now alone. I'm the most technically advanced guy, but people hate me. And what Lawrence say? You know, Johnny, success is a bitch. There's one problem with success, one side effect. As the more, the more successful you become, the more people will think you're a jerk and mushroom. Uh-huh. So why people should, they, should really support you? What it is for them and your success? Why should they? Uh, I don't care, I'm the most advanced guy. But the thing is that you never win a war with a one-man army, never. At some point, your growth will, will stop. Like you can be the smartest guy in the team and it stops because your success will depend mostly on others and what others are talking and saying about you. This is very important. Think about others' stake in your success all the time. Because people are egocentric, right? They think about themselves, why they should support you. Even, actually, if you are successful, they will not support you. They will not support you by default because kind of that, that's how it is, right? So. How do you choose, uh, you, you go to government election. How do you choose whom to vote for? 
How do you choose? How do you decide? Because someone has a great, uh, I don't know, haircut or great jacket? No. You think you're egocentric. You think solely about yourself or people you care about, relatives, maybe friends. So when you choose someone who vote for, you think, ah, this guy can bring benefit to me. Hmm, my, my, my children go to kindergarten. Aha, uh -huh. maybe he'll build a kindergarten. Oh, I'm a business owner. Wow, he promises tax reduction. Wow, this is good. You think solely about yourself. That's how it is. So when you open Facebook and see someone blaming some politician, what do you see? Oh, this guy is stealing a lot. Oh my God, he does nothing for us. Why do you say that? Because he doesn't, you don't have a stake in their success. However, is the same guy stealing even more, but gives you at least something from that. Oh, everyone is stealing, everyone is stealing. But this guy is a good guy, actually. He built a kindergarten there. That's how it is, life sucks. <laughs> so the question comes, did, uh, did Johnny do something, at least something, that made others interested in supporting him during this story? Did he make at least something? Huh? Laptops, exactly, you see? He reached a lot, he could just take his salary and leave. But what he did? Buy MacBooks to the whole team. It was, why? Because obviously if someone feels there's a stake, they continue supporting you. This is very important. This is very important, never forget it. But it was obviously not enough. So the message is simple. You succeed faster by helping people around succeed. It's counter obvious, it's not obvious, but that's how it is. If you run and scream how successful and cool you are, you actually build your negative image because you're the only one who says how cool you are. So instead of focusing on yourself, you focus on others and others start focusing on you because there's a stake. Do you know how Google PageRank works? You know, right? So it's a very simple idea. So if you want to appear in a search result, like a top search result in Google, you have to make sure that other websites are linking to you. They link to you, right? The more links you have, the higher is your page rank, okay? The same applies to your career. The more people talking about you, how good you are, the higher is your authority. Actually, PageRank also uses this term authority. This is obvious because people talk about you. And what's important as well, as this port, these websites grow in authority, it automatically propagates to you. Think about it. Basically, the more authorities they have, it just goes automatically to you, right? So no matter how good content you have, let's say on your website, perfect, well-polished content, think of skills you have. If no one actually refers to you, the only thing you have, you have a great content, but you have zero authority. Page rank and career development goes hand in hand. They, are, they use the same algorithm. So help peers achieve their career aspirations. This is very important. Do you know what your peers want? Do you want who they want to become? Managers, senior developers, cat herders. It doesn't matter who. Oops. Rich, at least. So there should be some details of how they want to get rich. So do you know what your boss wants to achieve? Your manager. Do you, have you ever thought about it? Who knows? What is your boss's goals, concrete goals? You see, and mostly no one knows, and this is very, and, and this is bad. Okay, do we you know your goals, your career aspirations? <laughs> Who knows? Your goals, where you want to be? Okay, money, I want to be rich, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the thing. So tomorrow when you come to work, think about your peers, your boss, your managers, whatever. 
think how they want to succeed and help them in doing that. Mentor your peers. Wow, mentor your peers. What, a, what an obvious thing, right? And uh, you have to mentor mostly juniors. You can't mentor anyone. You have to spend your time on juniors. You know why? You know why? Juniors. Juniors, because in IT world, everyone grows so fast. In the five years, juniors will become seniors, I don't know, company managers. You need only, they need only few years to become extremely successful. So you can't even, uh, right now you say, oh fuck, I don't want to spend time on preparing for this guy, helping him succeed. You have to, that's an investment. In, it pays a lot, it pays dividends. This is very important because for me right now, people I invest the time to, they pay me money. A lot of people, a lot of people whom I work with together and invest my time, right now they are my customers. I couldn't even think about it, I just did something that I think is right. And in the five years, I'm just looking back, oh my God, oh my God, how it's possible, that, that's how it works. Remember one thing, when you succeed, it's team success. When you fail, it's your failure. <laughs> Life sucks, right? So why it's important? When you have a great idea, don't scream, oh, I have a great idea. Go to your manager and say, hey, we have a great idea with the team. It's actually Alan's idea. Tell it it's either team collective achievement or someone's idea. Don't tell about yourself, Think, to tell, talk about others. You want to get a prize? Prize others. Say, hey, we are, we are doing a great job. Give others stake in your success. Remember it. However, if you fail, I failed. I failed. It, it was my personal failure. I learned from it. So what? So what? I failed. Yeah, I failed. You never can hide like a behind the team. Don't do it. Please, don't be jerk. When you fail, wake up. I failed. That's my fail. I learned from it. Next time I will fail differently. All my fails will be unique. My every failure will be unique because I learn from it. That's how you should be. Never be jerk. Don't hide behind your team. Okay? So what Johnny did? He started doing pair programming with junior members and everyone else. He, su he suggested reading videos. Uh, he started running clean coffee sessions, R&Ds, brown bags. He organized internal trainings to his peers. Simultaneously, uh, let's say when he finished his tasks first, on a daily stand-up, he was not telling, I'm first, I'm the best guy. He silently joined others and helped others deliver value faster than he can. After a year, Johnny was invited for discussion with top management. Johnny, you're doing a great job. Good boy. You're doing a great job, you know? Your team is now the most successful in the company. Customers are extremely happy, uh, happy and I want you to scale this success in the company. I want you to build more teams like this. Starting from day one, you're chief software architect, the most senior guy in the company. How do you call it this in, in your craftsmanship slang? Like, I want you to build this community of, p p community of, community of professionals. Yeah, yeah, community of managers, go ahead, right? <laughs> community of professionals, it's called in craftsmanship slang. Johnny meets his girlfriend. Chief software architect, really? <laughs> I knew you can do it. <laughs> I knew you can do it, you're my hero. Oh my God, my BF is a cheap software architect. We can go to Gavai. It sounds so sexy. Guess what happened next? <laughs> Success? Almost there, right? Johnny is successful, successful career. Almost there. Not that easy. Not that easy. Johnny didn't code for about two years. Mostly he was doing paperwork, negotiation, planning, sales, and he actually forgot who he is, and he forgot what his craft is. 
he became led by customers' decisions. He, he used technologies that are important to his customers solely. And uh, he was sent to customer side interview to get new project on board and failed drastically. He failed because interviewer, a regular Java developer, kicked his butt. Just kicked his, his butt. It was very simple coding exercise, very simple, and he didn't manage to do it. There were a plenty of questions from developer side and he couldn't even answer. But the questions are very important and sort of basic. When Johnny was asked how would you, would you build this small service, he said, oh, I'll use XSLT, WebSphere, AGB, and this Oracle stuff. And here's the message. It doesn't matter how senior in the company you are. Call yourself chief software architect, CTO, senior developer. It's a local measure. Remember, it's a local measure, my friends, because companies will pay you salary for things that they think are important for them. Not for you, only for them. And the drama is that the shittiest technologies they have, the more they will pay. That's how it works in the UK. That's how it is. It sucks, right? So never let someone or a company drive your career because you can't become blind. It's like a feeling of success. You get more salary, you have local promotions, but you can get blind. And the thing is that many hands-on CTOs I interview on a daily basis, company usually ask me to interview some very senior. So I'm a funny guy to, be, to, to attend interview, like I like joking about CTOs. And so, so the thing is that many hands-on CTOs, they can't even pass a regular development interview, but they're hands-on, they're the best in the team. It's a local measure, that's the thing. It sounds funny, but it's not. You don't really want to be there. Because one day you can wake up and find this yourself totally abandoned and there is no way back. The best job you can get is go to bank and use technology that totally sucks. <laughs> Think about it, it's very dangerous. Therefore, you have to validate your seniority against the rest of the industry. It's very important. You have to know where you are on the global market at least. So what I do, I attend interviews. I go to UK, like I, I go to different places, totally new for me, like Microsoft, I've been to Microsoft interview and I, I didn't tell them I don't need this job. <laughs> I didn't tell them, but I just said, hey guys, I really need this job. Ah, you're the best employer in the world. I want to work with you. I don't care, just <laughs> I just want to know where I am because they're more, this Microsoft, right? And I do it a few times a year at least. Actually, I have a Trello, I, I have a scheduler that generates a task in my Trello once in a quarter that tells Eddie, go and attend job interview. And I go and attend jo job interview, I know where I am, and I make new connections. This is cool, I understand where I am. You can also start doing, doing consulting. Consulting, hey for free, free of charge, totally. Just go and help someone or some new customer to get things done. You'll get new connections, you'll understand what problems customers have. Do it for free, just go ahead. You don't have to charge for it because it's, it's, it's solely for you to understand where you are and maybe to bring new customers. S all, uh, someone always mentions pet project, pet project, pet, pet projects. And this is cool, and uh, in craftsmanship uh, community, people say that you have to do pet project just in the sake of practice. Do you want to do this? Really? It sounds r romantic, like, oh, just sit down and code and like uh, polish your craft. Yes, it's cool. But uh, we are egocentric, really want to have more value just 
rather the more value than, than experience. We want to have a one million startup, right, as well. So you just do a pet project and suddenly it becomes a one million, pro one million project. That's what we want to do. It doesn't really work. However, for me personally, I can't, I, I can't force myself to do some pet project, blah, blah. But if it's just a pet project in the sake of pet projects, it doesn't motivate me a lot. So what I do, I decided that I will find inefficiencies in my personal workflow. I will constantly look at me like from the outside and see how I work, what I do, what repetitive tasks I have. And let's say I have this, uh, I pay a lot of invoices. Every day they, they come to my mailbox and I do this manual, this copy paste amount in the internet bank, la la la, prove yes. And every day, uh, not a big deal, but I do it every day and it disturbs me a lot. It's very annoying. So what I decided to do, hey, I'm going to solve this problem. So when invoice comes to, uh, to my mailbox, I process it via OCR. I take these important values like amount to be paid, bank account, customer. I log in automatically to internet bank. I enter all data and I make a payment. It's not actually legal to use internet bank in such a way, but no one caught me. So, and this is important. The thing is that I solved the problem for me. And here's the message. Actually, I, I have, I have, I, I think that it's a very interesting idea. When I do this, so I, I constantly looking for inefficiencies in my workflow because if I can find inefficiency in my own workflow, probably I can also find inefficiency in other people's workflows. If I can't find inefficiency in my workflow, what can I offer to my customers? And this is important because if I think that I'm an effective guy, la la la, something's wrong with me. One more thing, if I can solve my own problems, I probably can solve customers' problems, right? As is that, as it is. The thing is that right now I have a plenty of small pet projects. I don't have a million, one billion dollar startups actually, but they generate me a passive income so I don't have to go to work. So I just have a plenty of them and they generate money. And I wasn't, I didn't sit at home, oh my God, how I can make money, what should I build? I just started doing something that makes sense to me. And I realized that it makes sense to others, automatically. So pet projects, they have this cool side effect. So, and the message is following, very important message. The only measure of seniority is your freedom. Seniority and freedom, something weird. Freedom to decide what to do, where to do, for what money, when, and whether to do something at all. This is very important, just think about it. Everything else is sort of secondary, so stop complaining about someone's less experience at having more senior title than you have. Oh, I deserve better title. Who? Who cares? So the stop is chasing these titles because it doesn't really matter. For me personally, freedom is what matters because freedom is what lets you choose whatever title you want. This is very important. I do not know where John is now, <laughs> but, I've, but I'm pretty sure that after all learning that learning that he had and lessons uh, he took, he's in a good shape. And I'm going to conclude this story with one very simple quote. Do what you feel in your heart to be right. You will be criticized anyway. You'll be damned if you do and damned if you don't. So always be professional. I wish you good luck and thank 